So before we actually go through um, the different locations, I remember now I, I added another category of things. This just gives you a quick look at what some of the locomotives and cars and things look like that were serving Everett. So this is an example of a class L9 060 wheel arrangement steam locomotive. They had a whole fleet of these that served here and also uh, Seattle and they shuttled them back and forth in fact and uh, any kind of major maintenance was done in Seattle. But these steam locomotives um, served switching duties in Everett for many, many years. And there was a lot of switching to do because of all the big industries. They had three crews a day throughout most of the history, um, sometimes a fourth crew during the day just because of the, the volume of traffic. Uh, all of these uh, locomotives, except for a few, have been scrapped. Fortunately, there are a couple that survived. One of them is number 1070. It's at the museum up in Wickersham. Um, yeah, uh, so that you'll see a few photos of these as we go through. This is number 1128 here. Uh, here's another one. This is number 1111. This was the last one to serve in Everett. It was decommissioned in the fall of 1956 and sat in Everett for about a year before it was towed away in either August or September of 57. They, they, uh, crews know, knew this as the four aces, if I remember right. Uh, and here's uh, 1123, same deal. Most of these engines were cut up in Seattle, I think, in Ballard, if I remember right. Uh, here's, here's one here next to a car. This is, uh, this is a larger locomotive. This is 1766. That's a W3 class. It's a, it's a very common wheel arrangement. You can't really see it with the shadows here, but this is what's known as a 282 um, locomotive. Uh, and uh, the nickname was a Mike for Mikado. Uh, that was uh, a name that was given to them early on. But uh, these were more road locomotives. And this particular one ran the train, the log train, back and forth to Darrington and was uh, shopped overnight in, in Everett. And this, as the diesel era came, this was the first type of diesel that this part of the Northern Pacific saw. These are what is known as an FT. It was an early uh, electromotive division of GM diesel locomotive. And they came in sets. Uh, originally, they were four unit sets, right, Jack? The FTs? Yeah, they were coupled solid, two together. Yeah, and then pretty quickly they made the, this removable here. There was another, originally there would have been another one of these without a nose and then a one with a nose, but they made it so they could separate them into two units pretty early on, and that's what you see here along with a, a GP9 here. So this was very typical power, especially for the uh, daily train that ran. Jack ran that train for quite some time. That was when you had young family, right? So it was a pretty good job when you if you wanted to be at home. Yeah, it was, it was only 56 mile long. Went to work a little after midnight in Auburn. He got up to Everett around five o'clock. He generally went to work around three in the afternoon, right on your rest, and then home again. Right. And, uh, but that was, he made a round trip three days a week. Right. Two crews. Worked yep. very high pay, but it was regular, regular hours. Right. <laughs> Sorry? This is uh, diesel fuel. Yep. And the NP was not using oil burning locomotives in the steam days on this part of their system. They, they ha owned a lot of coal mines, and so they tried to use company coal where they could because it was cheaper. But in certain places, especially where there was a big fire hazard, they would run oil burners because um, there's more cinders, you know, coming out of the stack on a coal burning locomotive. This is another uh, FT set. This is almost for sure the Auburn Everett time frame again because they very often ran two FTs and a GP9 during this era here. This is what a GP9 looks like. Um, got two of them here. Could be the Auburn train. It's hard to say what it is exactly, but we, we think it is the Auburn train here. And this, uh, these white flags, which are actually not cloth flags flapping in the wind. These are steel painted white. This is to indicate that the locomotive, the train is running as an extra. It's not a scheduled timetable train. It's uh, running extra. And that's pretty much everything, well, except for a, a small period of years, every train in and out of Everett was run as an extra. And you'll see one thing the NP did with their early diesels that was very uh, interesting is they repurposed bells from steam locomotives. So when they were running at low speeds in town and things like that, they would use a steam locomotive bell. Very distinctive sound. I think they probably part uh, money saving and part they thought it was a nice loud sound and would catch people's attention so they wouldn't walk out in front of the train. 
Um, this is another GP9 here, number 220. Uh, here's another one, 254. There's a couple of them here. This is a, this is a new set of photos. Uh, this is from Paul Robeson, right, Jack? That's who we got these from, I think. He just uh, popped up, and Jack met with him, and he was happy to share some photos. This is a little later. This is not in the 50s. This is more like 1967, but things in Everett didn't change very fast, so it's very similar, very similar situation. You see what's left of the Eclipse Mill here after it burned in the background. But Paul took some really nice photos. He was just in high school when he took these, I think, right, Jack? Uh, Jack, um, the other Jack, Jack O'Donnell. Yeah. He was in, his, in high school when he took these, wasn't he? Yeah. And th this is actually uh, two Jeep 7s. This is an earlier design. It's hard to distinguish him from a Jeep 9. Here, a very common kind of traffic in, in, into Everett in particular are log trains. Um, had a lot of logs coming out of Darrington. And actually, you had a fair number of logs coming in from other areas, too, going to Weyerhaeuser and things like that. Uh, so a lot of log traffic. So interesting because this is getting to be pretty close to the end of having these what they call fairly small bunks to just, you can sort of see them here, more or less holding the logs in place. Uh, doesn't get to be too many years before you start to have these very substantial steel vertical pieces up the sides of the cars to help hold the logs in place. Because logs fell off a fair amount of the time. In fact, they would run log pickup trains a few times a year to go fetch logs out of the ditch that had fallen off. Um, and yes, people occasionally were injured or killed who were at the side. You know, if you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, you could meet your maker through a big tree hitting you. Uh, this is a, a caboose from a bay window class. It was very unusual at this point in the NP. These were getting to be pretty old cabooses, but there were a few assigned to local duty in Everett. And the crews didn't always use them, but they had them available. They often would just ride in the cab of the, of the switch engine because um, it was just hassle to have the caboose on the back of the train if they were doing a lot of switching. But these, these cabise were available. Uh, here's a couple of more photos from Paul that I just thought were really interesting. This is where the track from the Great Northern coming south from its freight house and made a big loop and passed right by the NP depot and then terminated in the NP main track, crossed the NP track going north up to the freight house. So this is where that diamond is. Took us a while to figure that out. Thanks to Dan for helping figure out where this was. There was a derailment here uh, about 1967. Paul captured that as well. 